Yeah. I'm Mike Breen, Public Awareness Officer for the American Mathematical Society, and I'm talking with Mac Hyman, who is the Evelyn and John G. Phillips Distinguished Professor of Mathematics at Tulane University, and he's an expert on uh, the math involved with disease, trying to modeling disease, and so we're talking about uh, COVID-19. Uh, Mac, uh, can you tell us what math is being used to model it and, and uh, the disease itself and its spread? Okay, well, well, math is being used at pretty much every stage of this epidemic. Um, when a, a new infection enters a town, the question is, is how quickly it will spread. And uh, in the early stages of an epidemic, this is when things called the butterfly effect really take into account. It matters if the first person infected is a bus driver or a hermit that lives at home. And so we have these virtual worlds on the computer, we call agent-based or individual-based model. Uh, imagine Sim City on steroids. We watch, we monitor people going to work, going to school, coming and traveling on buses. And we can simulate how the epidemic would spread uh, when it first enters the population. Now, an actual epidemic is only one realization of an infinite number of, of possible transmission routes. So we don't run the model once, we run it hundreds and thousands of times. And early in the epidemic, uh, the, the key is, well, first question is, since not every infected person will infect others, it's like, like not every spark in a forest will create a forest fire. If an infected case enters the city, what is the chance it will start an epidemic? And so we get an estimate of whatever it might be, like 20% of the time an infected person will start an epidemic. Then we try to predict how many people, we can't tell you how many people will be infected in say 20 days or 30 days, but, the early stages, we can get probabilities. So what is the probability that 100 people will be infected in two weeks? What is the probability that 200 people will be infected in two weeks? Uh, probably 300. So we can get probability distributions is all we can do in the early stages of an epidemic. And so these types of models are being developed. Now, once the epidemic takes off and we start seeing a trend line, then mathematics can extrapolate the trim line. And this is usually either a, a statistical model, uh, so like a regression model, or a very simple mathematical nonlinear model based on transmission dynamics. And we can do short-term forecasts with these models. So we've seen like with Wuhan, in Wuhan we saw the last, first two or three weeks of an epidemic, then we could predict maybe the next one to two weeks, but not much beyond that. And so models, can make these short-term predictions. And these are extremely useful because if the trend either grows faster than the expected uh, number of cases or grows slower, then we start looking for underlying dynamics. So in Wuhan, we saw that the early predictions were predicting an exponential growth, but when they, enter, when they uh, entered the uh, restrictions, the quarantine restriction, it was much less than that. So it's, ah, the quarantine restrictions are effective. Now, when they start lifting the quarantine infections, uh, quarantines, we'll see how much of a difference it makes. So the models can do this. And so you know, it's, it, I think I gather from what you're saying that, and what we maybe read in the newspaper or see on TV, they really, we don't know as much as we'd like to know about this. Uh, I guess you probably feel that way. Uh, is, is that knowledge progressing at a steady rate, at an increasing rate? Uh, it is steady, but in spurts. I mean, uh, for our models, one of the, some of the most important parameters, uh, we're just now getting the information on. Uh, for instance, um, for this particular, for most, viruses like flu and common cold, if it's on a surface, it's only viable for a few hours for infect others. There have been some preliminary tests with this coronavirus that it can stay viable up to 10 days on glass, plastic, um, and metal surfaces. So these, this has to be in the models and also maybe one of the, the major, major ways that it's spreading. Uh, actually, one of the surfaces that concern us quite a bit is on paper money. Uh, how long does the virus stay viable on a paper on a dollar bill or a euro? Um, and this becomes very important if we're trying to control the epidemic. So even with quarantine, if people buy goods with paper money, it's a way for the virus to escape quarantine. So these type of things we're just now getting the information on. Um, 
Sorry, go ahead. Oh, another, another extremely important thing for the model is how many asymptomatic people are out there spreading the virus. Um, the models assume that when you get very sick, you change your behavior, you stay at home, and we can account for this. But if only 20% of the people feel so sick that they don't, uh, that they stay at home, then a major vector could be asymptomatic people. And we just don't know what fraction of people are out there doing this. And then asymptomatic means they're not showing symptoms. Right. So they think that they're well, they may just have a small cold or something, but yet they're shedding the virus. And especially in the environment, they're infecting the environment, infecting others. And, and so you mentioned that now, is there any other really big thing you'd like to know about it, about COVID-19? Oh, <laughs> so many things. Yeah, like everything. Um, you know, for instance, um, what the most important thing I'd personally like to know is what are the most effective ways that individuals can do to help slow the spread of the virus? Uh, probably the number one thing we know is that when someone is infected or suspected to be infected, those are the people we need to, quarantine, not necessarily quarantine, but protect the most. Uh, things like uh, not just face masks, but uh, glo disposable gloves, uh, these type of things. So number one uh, is identifying the infection early so we can prevent the infected people from spreading to others. The second is how can susceptible people protect themselves? Uh, hand washing is very good, but for this virus, um, it may be insufficient, especially if it can be infected off of surfaces because you can do your hand washing and, and open a door two minutes later and get infected. Um, so one of the things that I do in my classes, so we're still holding classes at Tulane. Um, I have uh, hydrogen peroxide wipes that I, I get put in the door. The students come in, they grab a wipe, wipe their hands and wipe the desk and throw it away. And it's a few pennies uh, a student. And my, my word is you might be infected, but not on my watch. Uh, because we don't know who sat in that day, desk two or three days ago. And so very simple little techniques like this can greatly reduce the spread. And I'd like to see uh, more understanding about what are the most effective ways to do uh, to, that we can be doing and for enabling the public to do these. Um, beyond the you know social distance and hand washing, that's great. Um, I mentioned that this, everyone knows about the face mask. I mentioned disposable gloves. If I flew on an airplane today, I'd be wearing these little, you know, hand gloves that cost a few pennies and throw them away at the end of the flight. Little things like that we can be doing um, that I think, personally, I think would really slow the spread of this virus, but we need some validation of that. You know, these are heuristic gut feelings as opposed to things that are backed by actual test. And so there isn't enough data or knowledge from China where, you know, where the most cases are, are or were uh, in order to make those conclusions? Uh, well, what we did learn from China is that the quarantine is effective and it t has to be in place a long, long time. Hmm. The next thing we'll learn from China is when it's lifted, will it come roaring back? And so we're all waiting for that. It's so now you're talking about, you know, things that you'd like to know from a researcher's point of view. And, and now for mm -hmm. people who aren't in the research, but are, you know, are, are walking around in, in the general public, uh, you, you, know, you mentioned hand washing and, and protecting with gloves, perhaps. But is there anything else you'd like them to know? Well, for instance, uh, I mentioned paper money. Um, I've made it a policy that whenever possible, I use my credit card uh, for purchases for the next few months. Um, uh, when I w go into a restaurant where they have not been wiping the tables with hydrogen peroxide or Clorox, uh, I bring my own wipes. So just, uh, you know, the people need to realize that each one of us is responsible for protecting ourselves. Yes, it's, we, we feel a need to help protect others, but it's, um, but we are responsible for ourselves and to take on that responsibility, not to say, well, they didn't wash the table. Well, it, it takes little effort to carry your own handy wipes around. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's what I, I would pass on to others. Also, um, common sense. If you feel at all ill, stay home. If you visit a friend who at all feels ill, talk to him at the front, front door. But, you know, don't put yourself at risk. And if you feel that you've been infected, might possibly be infected, don't put others at risk. 
And hopefully these quick diagnostic tests will be rolled out soon in the US. And that will have a huge impact. Um, when we can you know, go through a, a drive-in uh, center and quickly take a, a swab and be tested. Um, we're, we're, yeah, hopefully that will happen soon. Now, now something I've seen in, in the newspaper is, is mention of the basic reproductive number. Uh, is, is that something that's known? Um, well, yes and no. <laughs> reproductive number uh, is the average number of people that an infected person will infect in a fully susceptible population when no one changes their behavior due to the infection. Okay. And so an average, if everyone acted exactly the same and the reproductive number was four, I mean, one person would infect four, those would infect four others, it'll spread twice as fast if it was two. Um, so it's good for general comparisons, but, but it's an average and it's appropriate for homogeneous populations where everyone acts the same. It's like uh, if the average income of one city was $30,000 and another had an average wage of 60, we'd expect the $60,000 city to be more affluent. But like New York City average in a wage income of 60,000. You, you pick an, 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 a random person from New York, the chances are they're not making 60,000 a year. It's the same way with the epidemic. In the early stages, start with a random person. That person could infect one person, people, person, or 20. And so when there's a wide variance to the number of people that a single individual can infect, then the reproductive number might is somewhat good for general comparisons, but it won't tell you what will happen in a specific epidemic. Uh, the reproductive number in Wuhan, oh, the other thing about re reproductive numbers is often not realized is that from the data we cannot estimate the reproductive number we can estimate the number of people that one individual infected individual will infect per day the reproductive number is the product of that times how many days that infectious person continues to infect others so it's a product of fitting the data plus how long times how long someone is infectious and so whatever assumption you make on how long someone is infectious, that will change your epidemic, your estimate for the reproductive number. And that makes sense because someone's infectious for four days will infect twice as many people as someone for two. And that's the product is all we can get. So Mac, you told us a lot about this. Is there anything you'd like to add? Anything you really want people to know? Oh, I think for the mathematics community, um, for the past, two decades, the NIH, NIGMS, has had a, a group of mathematicians, uh, epidemiologists, and public health workers called MIDAS, Models, um, Models for Infectious Disease Agent Study, MIDAS, who have been getting together yearly and biannually for, for quite a few years. And we have a huge community of mathematicians that are sharing data, sharing models, sharing software to try to come to grips with this. This is completely different than it was in the 1980s and 90s for HIV AIDS, um, for the novel H1N1 influenza, Zika, chikungunya. Um, this is, the mathematicians now have a seat at the table, both at CDC, WHO, and NIH. And it's, in playing this role, we have to be very, very careful not to oversell what our models can do. And that's the word I want to get because our models are just that. They're, I, I like the quote from Pablo Picasso who says that art is the lie that helps us see the truth. These models are lies that help us see the truth. Uh, and we have to re realize that they're simulations, you know, like a simulated diamond. We know it's fake. And we have to be very careful that our, to include the caveat that our predictions are based entirely on our assumptions even with our sensitivity analysis and our bootstrapping and uncertainty quantification, we only do uncertainty within the realm of the, how we allow our assumptions to vary. Um, and so for our community, we have to be very, very careful that we don't oversell our results. On the other hand, the results we do have can be extreme, extremely useful in helping understand where the virus is spreading, what mitigation methods will be most effective, uh, what the impact on the workforce will be, so the models can give us 
estimates for quantities that we have no other ways of measuring. So, so Mac, that, that's very informative. Thanks very much for taking the time to talk with us. I'm sure you're very busy. Uh, that's uh, Mac Hyman, who's the Evelyn and John G. Phillips Distinguished Professor in Mathematics at Tulane. Uh, and uh, Mac, again, thank you very much. And good thank luck. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye.